morning, everybody. Uh, this is uh, another colloquia uh, from the Instituto de Astrofisica de, de Andalucía. And today we have the talk by Dr. Elena Dominguez Sanchez. She will talk about stellar population gradients and kinematics of the ETG and as revealed by Manga. And uh, Elena will be introduced by our scientific director, Isabel Marquez. Isabel, please. Hello, everybody. Welcome again, and thanks for attending our, our Severo Ochoa uh, Colloquia. We are very glad to have you every week, almost, uh, here with us. It's a way of sharing things in these days. And um, I am especially grateful to, Elena, to, to our speaker today, Elena Dominguez Sanchez. Very, very, thank you very much for ac accepting our invitation, and thank you all, you all for being here. Elena, Elena Dominguez uh, Sánchez is a postdoctoral fellow at the Instituto de Ciencias del Espacio, the Institute of Space Science, um, the ICE in Barcelona, where she develops several projects on galaxy evolution and machine learning since uh, September 2019. Um, Elena Dominguez uh, Sánchez made her PhD at the Observatorio Astronomico di Bologna. In, in Italy and defended her thesis at, uh, thesis at the University, Universidad Complutense de Madrid in, two, in, in 2012 with the title Mass and Star Formation Rate Evolution of Infrared Selected Galaxies in the Cosmos Field. Uh, she then got uh, her first postdoctoral position at the IAC in the Canary Islands and then at the uh, Universidad Complutense de Madrid. In, in 2016, uh, she had a, a joint postdoc position at the University of Pennsylvania and the um, Observatoire de Paris uh, during three years. And after that, she came back to Spain to the IC in Barcelona. Uh, her work uh, focuses on galaxy formation and evolution from an observational point of view using large astronomical surveys, both uh, photometric and spectroscopic, over a wide range of wavelengths, from the X-rays to the far infrared. She is also an expert of artificial intelligence applied to astronomy, with the ultimate aim of her research being to understand how and why the properties of galaxies have changed across the history of the universe by exploiting big data surveys. So today she is going to talk uh, about the star population gradients uh, and kinematics of early type galaxies as revealed by the survey uh, Manga. So um, uh, thank you very much uh, again, Elena, and I extend, I, I take the opportunity to extend in this invitation for uh, a, a true uh, visit to the IAA when, when time uh, permits. Thank you. Thank you very much, Isabel, for the nice introduction. It's my real pleasure to be here uh, presenting the work in the Severo Ocha Colloquium. It's an honor for me, and I only wish it was in person, but as you said, we, it, this is just a delay. We will make it. Um, so I'm going to start sharing my screen so you can see uh, my presentation. Oops, sorry. Okay, compartir. I hope, uh, can you see the first slide now? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yes. Can you see my mouse too? Okay, yeah. perfect. So I'm going to talk to you about the stellar populations of early type galaxies revealed by the Manga survey. Uh, this is going to be a kind of dense and intense talk, so I hope you don't get too bored. I will try to focus your attention with bright color plots. Uh, this is uh, the summary of uh, most of the work that I have been doing during my, my postdoc at University of Pennsylvania with the valuable help of Mariangela Bernardi. And as, a, as um, Isabel said, I'm part now of the IFE and I continue my research with this uh, data survey the Manga survey, which is a great data set. Uh, and I continue doing some research and I will show you in the last slides some of the ongoing projects. Uh, okay, okay. So this will be the outline of the talk. I will first uh, try to convince you why early type galaxies are important and why we would like to know about them. Then I will introduce the data set, the Manga survey. And I will tell you about the stellar population gradients of elliptical galaxies. 
Then I'll, I will show you how uh, if the ellipticals are classified into slow and fast rotators, they show very important significant differences in their stellar populations. Um, then we will do the, I will present you the same kind of analysis for the lenticular population. And I will discuss whether lenticulars are early type galaxies, uh, elliptical galaxies, uh, fast rotating, just seen phase on. Then I will focus on the two mass scales, which are very special. And if I have the time, I will give some uh, words about the IMF, uh, the effect of IMF in the estimate of the stellar masses and the fundamental plane. So the first thing that one needs to know when uh, studying early type galaxies is what does early type mean? Early type, it's a classification based on the morphology of the galaxy, where according to the Hubble sequence, galaxies can be ordered from very smooth and round systems with no, uh, with no feature signs to things where the bulge is getting less and less important and the disk starts to appear and uh, so here you have the spiral galaxies with the disk and the bulge component. And this bulge becomes less and less important and the spiral arms become more and more uh, untight, uh, which are the late type, the late, late type of spirals. And then you also have the regular galaxies with no well-defined shape. And uh, this uh, lower branch is just the same, but with the presence of a central bar in the middle of the galaxy. So basically, when we refer to early type galaxies, we refer to both ellipticals and lenticulars. And the lenticulars are just a mixture of spirals and elliptical galaxies because they have a bulge and a disk component, but no signs of spiral arms. So in this work, I'm going to focus on this population over here. Why do we care about the morphologies? Uh, and what are the differences between what we know elliptical and spiral galaxies? And the interesting thing is that these differences in morphology also reflect very clearly in the intrinsic properties of galaxies, such as mass, uh, where the early type galaxies are much more massive than the sp uh, spiral galaxies, uh, the, uh, the age of the stellar populations, because the elliptical galaxies are mostly composed by old, uh, old stars, and that's why they present very red colors. While in the spiral galaxies, there's still ongoing star formation, mostly in the spiral arms, and that's why they have young stellar populations and bluer colors. And finally, the kinematics. Uh, while in the spiral galaxies, uh, they are uh, rotationally supported by the, very, the presence of a very flat rotating disk. Uh, the kinematics in the elliptical population uh, are dominated by velocity dispersions. So are the random motions with, uh, which keep the galaxy uh, turned together. Um, we can study the two populations by just making use of photometry. This is an image of an elliptical galaxy. And with the photometry, we can study things like the colors, the difference between the G and R bands, the surface brightness, the CERSIC index, which gives you an idea of the shape of the light profile, or the luminosity. And you see that for the elliptical galaxies, these properties are always in the high end, while if we uh, look at the spiral galaxy, these properties are always present lower values. So if I go back, you can see how different distributions the elliptical and spiral galaxies present uh, with respect to their photometric properties. But we can also study the spectroscopy of these galaxies. And because the content of them is very different, they will so clear uh, different uh, spectra. For example, spiral galaxies well, are all blue galaxies, as I said, because their light is dominated by hot young stars. And they have gas, which is heated by these young stars. So there are very clear emission lines present in all the spectra. While we uh, move to the older population of red, red and elliptical galaxies, you can see how uh, the young stars uh, become to die because they're very massive. Uh, so you don't have these bright red colors, you are uh, bright blue colors, you are more red. And more importantly, uh, there are some absorption uh, line features uh, due to the presence of, of the giant stars, which absorb, uh, absorb these, uh, these, these components. Um, so why do we care more about 
ETGs and spiral galaxies, or why do I care more about them? It's because even though the number of elliptical galaxies is pretty small, uh, the number is dominated by the, by the spiral galaxies, the mass budget is most in the local universe is mostly content, contained in early type galaxies. But moreover, the, these galaxies are red and then and they are supermassive. So it was uh, a challenge uh, for, for uh, theoretical models to understand how these such massive galaxies could be formed in such uh, uh, so early and, and have this old stellar population. So we uh, understanding when the stars were formed and when the galaxy was assembled, so when all the stars came together, is, are the questions that I would like to answer. In order to do so, um, one of the very uh, useful tools that we can use are the spectroscopy. However, um, there, is, uh, there are very important degeneracies, for example, the H metallicity degeneracy or, uh, or the dust extinction, uh, bec uh, because they have the same effect of reddening the spectra. Here you can see this is uh, an spectra of a galaxy with a star formation rate burst of 100 mega years and a fixed dust extinction. And you can see that the effect of aging the galaxy population is to make it, it more uh, redder color as I showed before. But this is exactly the same effect if we fix the, the age, but just add more dust extinction. And it happens the same with the metallicity. For example, here I'm comparing a one giga year old population with a 13 giga year old population. And by just changing the metallicity, you can see that the spectral shape are very similar. And there are features like H alpha, which are very similar, while you only detect the difference between the two with some absorption features such as the leak indexes which is what, uh, what we will use to measure the stellar populations of our sample. And in order to do so, we need to use very high signal to noise spectra because these are uh, weak features which are not uh, revealed when the signal to noise is low. In addition to, so um, until a few years ago, most of the spectroscopic studies were done by single aperture spectroscopy. So you had one spectra per galaxy, you integrated all the light or, or with a slit or with a uh, diameter aperture, but you had only one spectra for, uh, per galaxy. The revolution came with the integral field spectroscopic surveys because they provide especially resolved stellar populations because now you have different spectra in different locations of the galaxy. And moreover, this also allows you to measure the kinematics by deriving uh, rotational velocities and velocity dispersions. So around 10 years ago, the first surveys came, uh, uh, for example, Sauron and Atlas 3D, uh, which were able to study around 300 early type galaxies. And in these first studies, um, we could already see the, uh, the dependence between size and mass and the different rotation patterns here, you, you see the, the rotational velocity over here. Um, with more recent surveys, which have increased the number of early type galaxies, like SAMI, Khalifa, that many of you here are very, um, very familiar with, or Massive. And now, uh, uh, with these kind of studies, you can see how, for example, the color versus mass relation changes with respect to the uh, age of the stellar population. So you can see here the younger population being the fainter and, and bluer one. Uh, while, as I've been saying so far, the older population are the redder uh, elliptical galaxies. And you can combine these two things and a plot, uh, this is uh, the ratio of random to motion uh, movement. So this will be uh, fast rotators and these will be low uh, slow rotators. Um, and you can color code this by, by the age of the stellar population. And you see that there is a clear dependence where the fast, uh, slow rotators, which occupy this region over here, are the oldest uh, population uh, from the early type galaxies. And these are uh, words uh, previous from our papers, but I will show uh, very similar results in our work. So I'm going to now pass to the second point where I'm going to introduce the MANGA survey. MANGA survey is an integral field spectroscopic survey as the one uh, that I presented before. 
but it when when it's uh, done, it will present 10,000 nearby galaxies. So it's really large uh, survey. Uh, in this present work, uh, we we use the data release 15, which contains 4,000 galaxies, which is already a, a reasonable number. And uh, the good thing about Manga is that it has a very uh, wide wavelength range coverage with a high uh, resolution and a, a special sampling of one to two kiloparsec. And for some galaxies, we are able to reach uh, up to 1.5 RE with signal to noise five. Uh, this is how the kinematics of some of the galaxies uh, using the Manga data look like. So this is a very nice spiral galaxy. You see here, uh, the, the disk and the spiral arms. And here I saw the velocity dispersion map and the profile and the rotational velocity map and the profile. So each one of these dots, these single dots is one spectra. So these are really, really uh, um, uh, massive data. For some of the galaxies, we have more than 4,000 spectra. So we have a lot of information. The challenge here is uh, to summarize uh, and understand all this data. So for this galaxy, you see that there's a very nice uh, drop of the velocity dispersion from the inner part to the outer part. And this is a strong, uh, fast rotating uh, elliptic a spiral galaxy in this direction. If we look at an elliptical galaxy, now we can see that the velocity dispersion is much flat. It's almost constant throughout the galaxy. It's very high. And in this case, the rotation pattern is almost inexistent. And as I said before, this galaxy is completely dominated by random motion rather than rotation. Uh, finally, we have the lenticular galaxies, which as I said, is a mix of the two. You can see here the presence of a bulge and the disk, but the spiral arms are almost indistinguishable. And in this case, we have a little bit of a rotation and a big drop on the velocity dispersion. So the, uh, the results that I'm going to present from here on are based on four papers that I wrote um, with Mariangela Bernardi in, at UPenn. And I'm going to try to summarize the more important findings, but I may not have time to, to, do, to talk about everything. So if you're curious about something that I skipped, please ask me in the, later in the question task. And to focus your attention, because I know that Zoom in talks can be a little bit boring, I just want to share with you this uh, beautiful picture of uh, Philadelphia, which is where, um, where University of Pennsylvania is. This is the campus uh, with, with Penn over here. And this is where I develop most of the research. It's a great city to, to live in for a few years. But let's go back to science. So what are the scope of these four papers? We want to study the stellar population gradients of both the elliptical and the lenticular galaxies when initial mass function variations are allowed. Usually, IMF um, is a, something which is very difficult to derive. Uh, so most of the studies uh, ha uh, set this IMF fix to simplify things. But in this case, we wanted to see the effect of allowing for IMF variations. Why is this important? Because understanding the age, metallicity, and alpha enhancement gradients uh, are fundamental for constraining galaxy formation models, mass assembly histories, and in particular, uh, distinguishing between inside out or outside in quenching scenarios. And also, as I also in uh, my last part of the talk, the mass to light profiles, uh, when allowing for IMF variations, have a very important effect when deriving the stellar mass. Uh, both uh, from um, photometry, but also from uh, the dynamical stellar mass. So in order to measure the IMF, because the IMF is very subtle feature, very difficult to distinguish in the spectrum, we need to stack the spectra of early type galaxies. And we did that in radial beams. And then we compare our results with the leak indexes in the single stellar population models and uh, try to understand how this stellar population and kinematics correlate with other galaxy properties, such as luminosity, velocity dispersion, uh, size, and angular momentum. But let's look at it uh, with plots, which I think it's always nicer. First, I'm going to focus on the stellar population gradients only for elliptical galaxies. Okay. So, um, 
because we need to, to stack the galaxy spectra to achieve enough signal to noise. We want to achieve signal to noise of around uh, of the order of 100. Uh, in order to stack our uh, galaxies, we didn't stack all the population together, but we did four beans, uh, which are uh, represented by these four colors. By separating galaxies according to the um, central velocity dispersion and absolute magnitude. So these are bright galaxies and these are uh, um, galaxies with high velocity dispersion. Okay, and try to keep in mind this color code because I will use it in the fuse in the in the next slides. So this is uh, now we focus on one bin. We take all the galaxies from this bin. And then we take all the spark cells within radial beans and stack them together. So for all the galaxies in one bin, we produce 10 stacks at different uh, R over RE. And this is what I plot here. In this case, the, the spectra have been separated for visual clarification. But here, uh, the, the spectra are zooming in the regions of the leak indexes we are interested in measure. Uh, H beta, magnesium, the two irons, titanium, and two titaniums. And you can see already here that there are some differences in the, in the depth of these indices at different radius. Uh, we normalize them in the blue and red continuum and we smooth them to 300 kilometers per second. So now we compare the values of these leak indexes with the uh, expected values from single stellar population models. For example, if we plot H beta versus magnesium iron, uh, in the model's grid, you can see that the H increases towards this direction and metallicity increases towards this direction. And here I plot for each of the four beans that I presented before, the uh, eight or 10 radial beans that I have computed so far. So we already see that there are clear gradients in the properties of the stellar populations of these galaxies. This is in uh, towards out. So you can see that the ages uh, kind of decrease. And the same here, if we plot the irons versus the magnesium iron, uh, here this uh, change in this direction reflects a change in alpha enhancement, okay? So for the ones that don't remember the importance of alpha enhancement, it's related to the two type of supernova, supernova one and supernova two. Uh, the supernova one uh, have very low alpha enhancement ratios and take a long time scales. So when we have low alpha enhancement values, this reflects more extended star formation. And when we have high alpha enhancement values, this uh, is a reflected of more varsity star formations. Okay, so another index that we use is titanium-2, which is sensitive to initial mass function variations, but once the age, mass uh, uh, metallicity and alpha enhancement are fixed. So this is what you can see in this plot, where I plot the titanium, um, the titanium index versus magnesium iron, and all these colored grids represent different IMFs with the larger values over here and lower values over here. So again, we can see that there are some um, IMF gradients. And in fact, we can translate it into the IMF versus R over RE radius. So this is already the real profile of the IMF slope. And we see two things. First, that all galaxies in the center have a larger uh, IMF. So favor bottom heavy IMF. They have more low mass stars in the center than in the outskirts. And secondly, we see that there is already a difference between the, these two colors. Remember that these were the more massive uh, early type galaxies and these are the less massive early type galaxies. But in any case, the, the two populations are always above the uh, uh, commonly used Krupa IMF slope. We can do the same trick. Uh, so we can derive now the radial gradients of the age, metallicity, alpha enhancement, and mass to light ratio. For our four beans here, I keep here the color code so you can uh, uh, follow it. So remember these are massive galaxies and these are the less massive, less uh, with lower uh, velocity dispersions. So what we can see in all of them are mild to negative age gradients, which are stronger for uh, galaxies with low sigma at a given luminosity. So they are stronger for the blue and the, and the yellow one, the gradients, oops, sorry. 
Um, the metallicity gradients are strong and negative for all the galaxies, but galaxies with a larger sigma the, um, uh, have higher um, metallicities in the central regions um, and also with the higher magnitudes here, the, the yellow and the red. For the alpha enhancement, uh, there are negligible or even positive alpha enhancement and the values are, um, <clears throat> are smaller for the galaxies with a lower sigma at a given magnitude. And here, uh, for the mass to light ra radiance, these are very significant when we allow for the um, IMF variations. Uh, they can be as large as a factor two. And if I have time, I will show you the impact that this mass to light gradient has on the derivation of the stellar mass of galaxies. And finally, I want to mention that the green bin, this bin here is the oldest, even though it's not the more massive one, nor the one with the higher velocity dispersion. And uh, keep in mind this, because I will go back to, to this um, fact that got us intrigued for a few months. Okay, so that were the stellar population gradients of the full uh, population of ellipticals. Now we're going to separate them between uh, slow and fast rotators. So here uh, in, the, uh, in the previous slide, I saw you a very nice example of a slow elliptical rotator with almost no rotation at very uh, constant velocity dispersion. But there are also elliptical fast rotator galaxies. You can see this is a clear elliptical galaxy, has no disk component, no spiral arms, and yet it has a strong, strong uh, uh, rotational velocity, even larger than 200 kilometers per second and also has a gradient in the velocity dispersion profile, but uh, which flattens at around 150 kilometers per second in the outskirts. So this uh, has um, the relation between the kinematics and other galaxy properties, such as the star formation rate and mass, was uh, already um, known uh, from previous works. Uh, and this cartoon comes from Juan et al where you can see how uh, uh, the star formation rate mice plane very nicely separates these populations of star forming disk galaxies, where you start to have less and less star formation rate, the bulge component starts to appear. And um, the, the fast rotators occupy the low star formation rate mass plane, but uh, they only exist up, up to a certain mass. And the low rotators are the galaxies are always the more massive and the uh, more quenched uh, star-forming galaxy, uh, galaxies in the star-forming region. We can also plot these uh, populations in the size versus mass plane. And here, uh, uh, already these three mass scales appear that I will also mention them later. So below this mass scale, there are no um, uh, early type galaxies. Um, and the size and mass increase, uh, they, they follow the same slope. Uh, in this uh, mass range between 210 to the times and 310 to the 10, there's a change in a slope where galaxies become smaller uh, while becoming massive. So these are very compact galaxies. And we have here um, the fast rotation, uh, rotator population, uh, fast rotator population. Now in this other mass uh, range, the, the, slope, um, be, uh, change, the slope change sign again. So again, size increases with mass. And it's only at the very high mass end where the slow rotators appear. So we did that uh, for our sample of elliptical galaxies. Uh, we divided our sample into large and small. Uh, so here, I, the, the four colors that I have before, I split it into dark and light. So these are the large and the small galaxies according to their uh, uh, size uh, absolute magnitude relation. So galaxies which are above their median for their bin are considered large, and galaxies which are below the, me the median uh, are, become, are considered slow. And what we saw is that if we divide the sample into slow rotators and fast rotators, the slow rotators the fast rotators are smaller than, sorry, the fast rotators are smaller than the slow rotators, this is a typo, of the same luminosity or mass. And this could be um, an indication that these fast rotating galaxies had more dissipation. 
We also studied the stellar populations of uh, elliptical, of fast and, um, and uh, slow rotator ellipticals, okay? So in order to distinguish between L, uh, fast and slow rotator, we made use of the angular momentum versus ellipticity diagram. And we de define as slow rotators the galaxy which fall into this uh, tiny little square over here. So uh, we did the same trick, we did the sucking of the spectra, we measured the leak indexes, and now here I plot the H beta versus magnesium ion for the fast rotators and the slow rotator elliptical galaxies in this particular beam. And already from this plot, you can see that there's a striking difference in the age of these two populations. And in fact, it's not only the age, but it's also the metallicity and the alpha enhancement. And fast rotators, which are uh, the ones represented by the, by the uh, empty ellipses, are younger, more metal rich, and less alpha enhanced than the ell elliptical slow rotators of the, same, um, of the same beam. And we did that for the four beams uh, that I presented in, in the previous image. And for all of them, we see the same trend that uh, slow rotators, fast rotators, which are now the empty symbols, are younger, more metal rich, and less alpha enhanced. And this is consistent with, uh, with this plot that I already saw you in the introduction, where we saw that elliptical, uh, uh, that the fast rotators, which are galaxies located in the upper part of this panel, are younger than the slow rotators over here. But this was not uh, identified in a paper by McDermott in 2015 uh, by using individual spectra of Atlas 3D. So we highlight here the importance of having enough signal to noise and to make a careful analysis in order to, to, uh, to properly characterize the stellar populations of elliptical galaxies. We also try to study the environment dependence by dividing our galaxies into central satellite and becoming to high low masses above and below 10 to the 13. But we find no clear dependence, no conclusive results. And that's why we are extending this analysis to the data relic system, which will include, um, which will double the size of the sample. So hopefully uh, the statistics will be increased and will give us more hints about the the environment um, role in all these properties. So I'm going to move now to the, to the stellar population gradients of lenticular galaxies, okay? So, so far we've studied the ellipticals, we have divided them into slow and fast rotators, and now we're going to the lenticular galaxies. For the lenticular galaxies, we use the same approach. So we took our sample of lenticular galaxies, we uh, select, divided in beings of velocity dispersion versus absolute magnitude. And now I have, instead of four, I have uh, nine beings, which complicates a little bit the color coded, but I told you I was going to catch your attention with these bright plots. Uh, and I will try to, to include this plot in all the discussions so you don't get lost with all the colors. In a case, we measure the leak indexes again in radial beams, and already from this plot, you can see that there is a clear, uh, a different behavior from these reddish colors, which are the ones which are the less bright lenticular galaxies, with respect to this uh, bluish uh, purple, purple size, which are these a little bit more massive lenticular galaxies. And I will show you uh, through the next slides that these differences are very striking, actually. So again, we derive the age, metallicity, alpha enhancement, and mass to light radio gradient. So this is versus radius. Uh, here, I separated the populations in the three magnitude beams. So there's one column for each of the magnitude beams. So you can see here the reddish, reddish, purple, and bluish, okay? And remember, these are the fainter and these are the brighter galaxies. So if we fix the luminosity, if we focus in one of the columns, we see that the galaxies with the larger sigma, so the, the, uh, the larger sigma, are older. So this one is older than this. Um, more metal, uh, less metal rich, although in this case it's not very uh, clear, but it is here and here, and more alpha enhanced. Okay, so if we fix the, um, the luminosity, we can see that the age 
more or less is correlated with the, the same color code as here. But if we now fix the velocity dispersion, so if we move in this uh, parallel line, or horizontal lines, and we compare the uh, red with the magenta with the bluish, what we see is that uh, the more luminous ones, the ones which are over here, are the younger galaxies. Okay, so for these galaxies, the usual statement that massive galaxies are older is not true if, sigma, if the central velocity dispersion is fixed. Okay, you can see, and it also happens, uh, so this is the best example because we have the three, but it also happens from the, um, from the red to the, to the pink one, okay? And this is exactly what happened with the green bean that was striking us for a few months, and is that the green is older than the yellow in the same sense that the uh, red is older than the pink. Okay, so um, there was also a little bit of discussion uh, in a few papers about the, the existence of elliptical fast rotators and the fact that they could be uh, lenticular galaxies just seen face on. Um, so this is what we wanted to, to test here. Um, here I saw, this is, a, this is a lenticular galaxy and this is a fast rotating galaxy. So you see more or less uh, like this, it would be difficult to distinguish them. So what we did was to select galaxies with a low ellipticity. Uh, as you can see here, we divided our sample into elliptical slow rotators, elliptical fast rotators and lenticulars. And you see here uh, how they, they uh, behave in the ellipticity versus mass plane. So the lenticulars and elliptical fast rotators, the green and the blue colors, they have very similar rotational velocity at RE while the slow rotators have a much slower uh, rotational velocity. But on the other hand, the boost to total for the fast rotators is more similar to the one for the slow rotators than for the lenticular galaxies. Also, if we study the velocity dispersion in the center and at one RE, we see that there's little variation for the elliptical slow rotators and for the elliptical fast rotator, while there's a great uh, variation in the lenticulars. This is probably better expressed here as the fraction of these two. And you can see that the lenticulars have a much larger gradient of velocity dispersion than, uh, than phase on elliptical fast rotating, and, which, uh, and even higher than the elliptical slow, slow rotator. This is the difference with respect to kinematics. Now we can also study the difference in the stellar population. So basically in this plot, I'm combining the lenticular population with the elliptical population. Remember these were our four uh, starting colors. Now we added two additional panels to be able to compare, uh, to extend our comparison. So now the green and the green belong to the same bean blue and blue, purple, purple, and pinky, pinky. And we plot here the age, metallicity, alpha enhancement, mass to light ratio profiles for the lenticular galaxies, which are the field symbols, and for the elliptical galaxies, which are the empty symbols, okay? So in general, the lenticular galaxies, which remember are the, the field symbols, are younger, more metal rich and less alpha enhanced for as the when you compare them with ellipticals in the same beam. But more importantly, if you look at the gradients, okay, so here I'm, I'm plotting the difference, uh, the age versus metallicity from the inner part, which is plotted as the, as the circles and how these gradients move, okay, along, uh, around the sides. So if we focus on the lenticulars, which are the field symbols, they have strong age gradients, they move a lot in this direction, but they have almost fixed metallistic gradients. And this is just the opposite that happens for the elliptical fast rotator. They have uh, almost flat age profiles, but they have stronger metallicity gradients. 
So by comparing the slope of the velocity dispersion and the stellar population gradients, uh, this suggests that uh, we cannot just conclude that elliptical far rotators are uh, lenticular galaxies seen phase on. And one of the things that we, the scenarios that we propose is that they can be a result of a major merger between an elliptical galaxy and a fast rotating galaxy, which can be a, a this galaxy or another fast rotating galaxy. Okay, so now I'm going to move uh, to the two mass scales, which are special, which we already saw in the cartoons that I saw before. But we already, uh, we also saw this, uh, the effect of these mass scales in our data. Uh, here I saw the size versus mass relation and the velocity dispersion versus mass relation for our galaxies divided into lenticulars, elliptical far rotators, and elliptical slow rotators. And you can see, and I mark here, these two mass scales, which are three times 10 to the 10, and two times 10 to the 11. And you can see here that these, uh, these uh, mass scales uh, mark a curvature in the scaling relations, okay? And in addition, above this, the high mass scale, there are almost no lenticular galaxies. And on the other hand, below this mass scale, there are almost no ellipticals, whether are fast or slow rotators. If we um, study now the, the number counts and, and the fraction of the population, we can study uh, the fraction of lenticular, elliptical fast rotators, and elliptical slow rotators as a function of uh, mass. But we can also do the other uh, way around, the fraction of galaxies with the different mass and different morphologies. So this is uh, the distribution at fixed morphology, and this is the distribution at fixed mass. So in the higher mass bin, we see that the number of galaxies is dominated by the slow rotators, having more than 40% of, of the galaxies are uh, uh, elliptical slow rotators, and less than 1% of the lenticulars are so massive. In the intermediate range, the bluish colors, uh, the number is dominated by the lenticulars, but of an uh, and of the elliptical slow rotators, 50% of them are in this mass bin, but only 35% of the lenticulars are in this mass bin. And for the lower one, uh, there are very few elliptical slow rotators, and more than 65% of the lenticulars are located in that mass bin. And uh, in the number count, there are 87% of the galaxies are lenticular in that mass bin. This is not only about the fraction, it's also about the properties. And let's go back to this plot where I saw the difference between the reddish colors and the others. Okay, so we can, we can plot this uh, plot in the H versus metallicity. So here again, you see the gradients. This is the inner part and the outer part. And you can clearly see that for the reddish galaxies, which are the galaxies which are the lenticulars below three times time to the 10, the age gradients are almost flat, but the metallicity gradients are very significant. And when you cross this line, it happens exactly the opposite. You start having almost no metallicity gradient, but you have a, a stronger age gradient. Okay, so I'm, okay, I'm, um, I'm about to finish. I have two, two more things to show you. I think I have time to, to go through that, through that. And I'm going to move to the effect of the IMF in the estimation of the stellar mass. So as I said in the, at the very beginning, we wanted to take into account the possibility that the IMF is not fixed in different regions of the galaxy. And we wanted to test that because uh, the IMF enters in the calculation of the stellar mass derivation, both in the stellar mass derived through the luminosity and in the stellar, the, what is known as the dynamical mass. Okay, so let me try to explain this clearly. 
uh, for the stellar mass divided by the luminosity, basically what you do is you measure the luminosity, you assume a mass to light radio, you multiply the, this factor by this, and then you get the stellar mass. So definitely the mass to light radio is going to affect your stellar mass. But it also affects the dynamical mass derivation. How? First, let me explain how you measure the dynamical mass. For the dynamical mass, you have observations so for the velocity dispersion, okay, which are kind of flatties. And then you have the light profile. Your light profile, you uh, in the in the uh, looks like this, okay. In the inner part, you make it, um, you scale it so it matches the observed rotational velocity in the inner part, where that matter is supposed to be negligible. And then you assume that your mass to light rate is constant, and therefore the light profile reflects your mass profile. So when once this scale, sorry, once oops, once this scaling is done, then you assume that the mass profile, sorry, that the mass profile is the same as the light profile. But what happens if your mass to light rating is not constant and you have less mass for a given light at a given radius, then your mass to light radio, uh, your, your light profile will be larger than your actual mass, okay? So you will have less mass, and these at the same time translates in more dark matter because the difference between the what you expect between the observed rotational velocity and the observed mass is the dark matter component. Okay, so basically the difference of having a mass to light gradient or not having it is that your light profile is not anymore a reflect of your mass profile. You have to take into account the difference between the mass and the light profile. Um, and as I saw uh, in a few slides up below, we saw that there are very significant mass to light gradients up to a factor of two, uh, which as I said, they are higher in the inner parts and lower in the outer parts. So if you compare the dynamical mass versus, so this is the ratio of the dynamical mass versus the stellar mass uh, versus sigma. And we saw uh, for, for a few years, there was a, a very large discrepancy between these two. And because uh, it correlated with velocity dispersion, many people thought that, okay, so instead of um, deriving the dynamical mass just as a function of the velocity dispersion, let's add uh, the difference of the light profiles, but let's assume that mass to light is constant. So this improves things a little bit, but the, the real agreement comes when you take into account not only the different light profiles due to different morphologies, but also the inclusion of the mass to light radio. And here, uh, these two masses, the dynamical mass and the stellar mass are reconciled. But what is more important, uh, so this is the, the stellar mass function by using, uh, this is the dynamical mass and this is the stellar population, the, ma the stellar mass using a Chabrier IMF. So you can see that this uh, mass estimate had a big effect on the stellar mass density, which is a very important parameter for our understanding of the universe. So the good thing about um, the mass to light rate variations is that it reconciles the two, but not by increasing too much the, the, the mass function using the Chabrier IMF, but rather by making the dynamical mass much slower. And this is good because it's, uh, it's in better agreement with theoretical models and simulations. So uh, you, uh, in conclusion, it's the dynamical mass which is mostly affected by assuming a mass to light radio constant, while uh, the assumption of using a fixed IMF uh, for uh, like a Krupa base uh, for deriving the stellar mass is not so important for the total mass estimate. Okay. And I have, I think I have uh, some minutes to talk about the fundamental plane. Uh, so for the fundamental plane is basically, uh, you can express the mass as a function of the radius and velocity dispersion for the Virial theorem. And you can express the light 
uh, the luminosity as a function of the, the product of the radius times the luminosity. So you can rewrite this and you will have that the radius is proportional to the velocity dispersion and to the, uh, to the luminosity, to the flux, sorry. And because one of is distance dependent and the other is not, this is interesting for cosmological studies. So if we compare this with this, we will expect this alpha coefficient to be a two and this beta coefficient to be a minus one. Um, so we did the fundamental plane here, radius versus all this uh, formula over here, which takes into account velocity, dispersion, luminosity, and also the V over A. And the first thing that we notice is that if we only include the elliptical slow rotators, then this fundamental plane is much thinner than if we include fast rotators or lenticular galaxies. So we got the, thin the thinness, we removed the scatter by quite a lot. However, there's a still this tilt. Remember that I told you this should be a two and this should be a minus one, but these values are not the same. But if you now replace the uh, intrinsic brightness and take into account the mass to light ratio, now this coefficient, apart from uh, uh, this uh, uh, fundamental plane, apart from being also, also uh, with a small scatter, now these values start to resemble the two and minus one that we expect from the virial scaling relation. Okay, so finally I reached to my conclusions. Um, there, this was a lot of information, so I'm going to try to summarize the take home messages. There's a very important difference between elliptical fast and slow rotators, and the fast rotators are younger, more metal rich, and less alpha enhanced, and smaller, than the slow rotators of the same luminosity and central velocity dispersion. We also try to demonstrate that the elliptical fast rotators are not, not just phase on lenticulars uh, due to their uh, velocity, uh, to their kinematic profiles, but also to their stellar population profiles. And it suggests that this could be the result of a major merger between uh, and, uh, and a fast rotating galaxy. And finally, I want to uh, remember that the statement massive galaxies are older is not true if the central velocity dispersion is held fixed. Okay, regarding the two special mass scales, uh, in the higher mass n, this is totally dominated by elliptical slow rotators. Uh, in the intermediate mass, uh, there, there are a lot of lenticular galaxies, which show strong velocity dispersion and age gradients but little or no metallicity gradient. And in the lower mass range, there are very few ellipticals and the lenticulars have flat age and velocity dispersion profiles, but uh, increase, uh, but significant metallicity profiles. Regarding the IMF variations, uh, the mass to light gradients resolve the discrepancy between the dynamical and stellar population based estimates. And regarding the fundamental plane, if we only use elliptical slow rotators, then this fundamental plane is remarkably thin. And by uh, using, um, and it's even close to the virial scaling, uh, uh, scaling relation, uh, using, uh, by taking into account the mass to light rate. Okay, and just if I have a few more minutes, to talk to you about uh, work in progress or uh, for example, this recently published uh, letter that, uh, that I published with my collaborator Mark this summer, where we uh, look for hidden AGNs in dwarf galaxies in manga. And what we did was to study the BPT diagram for each of the spaxels in the galaxy. And we selected galaxies with, uh, with enough spaxels classified as AGN we did uh, stack their, their spectra to make sure that the, the emission line uh, was not, not just noisy BPT diagram, but that it existed. And you can see first that this is uh, the classification for the single aperture uh, Sloan uh, spectroscopy, which posts it as a composite or even star forming galaxy, because most of the emission is coming from the center, which is not dominated by the AGN component. Uh, in addition, for example, in this case, we thought we saw 
there was a broad component that was not taken into account in the manga data analysis. So we um, did our measurements ourselves and were able to derive the black hole mass. And this is a candidate for an intermediate black, black hole mass. And is one of the first hidden type AGNs, type one AGN discovered uh, in a dwarf galaxy using IFU. So we are doing the same exercise for AGN galaxies in early type galaxies, for a, looking for AGNs in early type galaxies. And I have other ongoing projects uh, related to manga. For example, I'm studying the, the principal components of lenticular galaxies in collaboration with Jaime Perea, Josep Tosa, Josep Maria Solanes, hi from here. Um, we're also trying to, as I said, uh, extend the environmental dependence of early type galaxies with a larger survey. Uh, I'm also looking for relic galaxies in manga and studying AGN outflows. And for those of you who don't know my machine learning based research, here are some, um, some topics that I've covered. So recently, we just sent to the journal a paper where we classify 27 million galaxies from the dark energy survey by using deep learning convolutional neural networks. Um, I also de derived the morphological catalog for Sloan, which contains 600,000 galaxies. Um, I'm working now on the manga morphological galaxy for the, uh, well, I, I did derive the morphological um, catalog for the manga data release 15, and I'm working now on the data release 16. By the way, this is the morphological catalog that I used throughout the work to separate elliptical and lenticular galaxies, which I didn't mention up to now. And I'm also interested in tidal stream detection and also collaborating uh, with Chema Diego, Alberto Manjón, and Diego Herrera on the detection of lensed quasars in JCAS. And I think that's all for me. Thank you very much, Elena, for a very nice uh, talk, impressive work. And now... Thanks. Thanks for your patience. I know it was a lot of information. Well, very complete work. And now we can open the talk for questions. I have the question now. First, uh, uh, Rainer, I need to say to all the participants that you can raise your hand and then I will give you the the right to talk. So first is uh, Rainer, please go on. Yeah, thank you, Elena. Um, very good talk. I mean, I'm I'm always happy when I can learn things from areas that are not mine. So so that for me is a sign of a good talk when I can learn something and understand something. So um, the one of the questions that came to mind is. I may have missed something because of the dangers of Zoom. Sometimes one is distracted by other computers around one. But uh, um, the mass to luminosity variations, uh, I'm not surprised that we find them. I think you're, uh, you sounded very relaxed about throwing around mass to luminosity ratio and IMF variations. Uh, I may have missed the connections, but is it? so straightforward to say mass luminosity directly translates into IMF variation. I mean, I know these beasts are old, but they, they don't have the same ages. Uh, your, your luminosity is always dominated by a small percentage of the stars. So I don't know. I just wondered how, how you would say whether you, is it that easy to conclude that it's the IMF that makes it mass luminosity variate? Yeah, so you have to, um, to, uh, um think that the mass to light uh, uh, ratio comes from the theoretical models, okay, from the SSP models. Once you, so once you have your age mass, uh, so, sorry, your age alpha enhancement metallicity fixed and IMX fixed, this will give you a, a theoretical mass to light ratio, okay? So this is not something that we derive, this comes from the single stellar population models. And if you think of it, basically what is the mass to light ratio is telling you how much mass given a, a brightness you have, right? So if you have an IMF where you have many low mass stars, okay, these low, these low mass stars, they are not very bright, but if you add them up, they will contribute to the mass. 
Okay. No, I, yeah, I, I get the reasoning. I'm, I've just, the problem is I've played around with these problems in a completely different regime that is resolved stellar populations. Mm -hmm. And also with probably far more complicated star formation histories, uh, which is our galactic center. And the problem is that my impression is that, that what I really measure, the light, okay, the light is difficult because it, occasionally if you have a very small percentage of bright AGB stars whatsoever, they, they really, really dominate the lights. But the other problem is also that I find that if you look at these old systems, you are dominated probably also by a very, very narrow range of mass. I'm not sure. I mean, there's lots of small mass stars, but since the luminosity is a very a highly nonlinear function of mass, I am worried that you're, you're dominated really by a very narrow mass range. And I, I'm not sure whether that can really give you a handle on the IMF, because you're typically dominated by a mass range that is maybe plus minus 0.2 solar masses, while the IMF goes from 0.5 to 100 solar masses. So, so this is the one thing where I'm, I'm a bit doubtful, but yeah. as I said, these are completely different systems and more easy than what I'm looking at. You're totally right, I think. And, and I'm, I'm going to show this plot, okay? Where uh, here is how the titanium, which is the index that we use to measure the IMF, okay. correlates with the different IMF slope. And as you say, yeah. When you have very sim, uh, um, the IMF slope has low values, these are very tight together. They're very, very difficult to distinguish them. You need to measure very small uh, uh, changes in the titanium. So in this regime, it's really difficult to say something. But definitely, you can say that having this titanium over here is not the same as having this titanium oh, yes. over here. I see, I see. And I, yes. so these are things that could be measurable. Of course, um, there are a lot of assumptions here. We assume a single stellar population, which may not be the, uh, the exact proxy for, for galaxies. Um, we are first fixing the age, metallicity, and mass, and then we play around with the, with the IMF. So of course, we are uh, subject to uncertainties. Um, but we thought it was better than just assuming that the IMF was fixed. No, no, I mean, that, that I'm, not, I'm not throwing that into question. I, I just thought you were very nonchalant about throwing this together. But it's true that uh, with, uh, with the spectroscopy, of course, if you look at lines, you, you get more additional information. That's, that's true. That's one thing I did not take into account. Thank you very much. OK, thank you, Rainer. Uh, there is another question by Rosa. Please go on. Um, hi, Elena. It Hola. was a very, very nice talk. Thank Congratulations. You. And also very good work you have done and very intense. So uh, I have a, a question also related with the IMF, but uh, because they have mainly covered, I will change a little bit the, the question. Um, and something that worried to me about the, the, the result is just your point out is that in fact the analysis is uh, related with the with single stellar population but in general galaxy cannot be uh, also now we know that even in particular the, the, the lenticular and also the fast rotator cannot be uh, considered as a um, or modeling as a single stellar population. So I wonder if you have uh, checked some of your results, assuming, um, for example, a full spectral fitting and um, different combination of uh, star formation history of um, or using no parametric code that give you to you a answer that it is more related with the a composite stellar population for this object? Yeah, that's a very interesting question. We, we did not take into account different star formation histories, nor full spectral fitting code. In, in, um, for one reason is that other teams in Manga were doing this analysis. For example, there is the Firefly catalog, which does the full spectral fitting and derives um, a stellar population for each of the spaxels. So we thought we wanted to have an, a complementary approach to also see 
how things change. What we have done uh, quite a lot, and it's, this is included in the appendix, is to study the difference, um, the different results by using different models. Because I didn't mention it here, but uh, so far everything that I presented was using the Miles Library uh, from Batekis, uh, but we also use the Marathon and the Tang and Worthy libraries. And the results are very different just by using different single star population models. So if you start including the star formation histories, uh, yeah, the results uh, will be affected. This is something that we have to accept that this is not totally true, uh, that there are some uncertainties uh, which come with our assumptions. Uh, so I think that the important thing is to mention which are your, uh, which is your method so that you are able to compare fairly with other works using similar approaches. Okay, thank you. Um, on the other hand, I will be happy that you find a very similar result for the fast rotator to the result that we have obtained with the Khalifa using the full spectral fitting. Yeah. That in fact, was very different to the result that was obtained by the Marasto group using also their own code uh, on full spectral fitting. Mm -hmm. So I uh, just worry, but I'm happy that <laughs> you are <laughs> getting the similar result that we got uh, in particular for the ages, uh, gradients and metallicity in the, in the uh, most of the fast rotator that the Califa Galaxy dominate. Um, also, the, the other question is more related with uh, another concern that I have with respect to the, to the manga data, is that the, in fact the, the manga uh, is, covered, or, um, is covering mainly the central uh, 1.5 effective radio. They cannot go further in the, in the um, observing the, the mass of the, of the galaxy. And also because um, the sample is um, is significantly uh, far away. That, for example, the the Sauron or the Atlas 3D or the Khalifa uh, galaxy, you are covering this uh, a special um, distribution with only a small number of fever. So, mm -hmm. how can affect your result? Did you um, make any change of the how changing the gradient? If in the case that mm, the galaxy will be covered to further distance, or also you can cover with a better spatial resolution? So regarding the spatial resolution, um, I'm not an expert on the, on the uh, manga pipeline, but I think they use a different method. So basically they point, uh, they move a little bit the pointing. So even though the fibers are uh, larger because they do different pointings, then they have better spatial resolution in the central parts. Uh, regarding the outer parts, uh, because we wanted to measure IMF uh, in a robust way, we didn't even reach the 1.5. We stop at our analysis at 1RE. So definitely uh, extending our analysis to outer radius will be extremely interesting. And that's probably where you can have the more important changes in slope. So one has to be very careful when comparing gradients uh, to uh, up to which radius uh, the work was analyzed. And uh, what, uh, okay, and for regarding the special resolution in the inner part, we did some, some tests. For example, when we compare the, the rotational velocity for the fast rotators and the lenticulars, we also excluded galaxies which were um, too small to be affected for the for the uh, aperture and for the spatial resolution of manga, and the result was uh, was the same. So um, uh, we, we we have taken that into account at, at some extent. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Rosa. Here, uh, Mark, want to ask a question? Uh, yeah, good. Thanks. Uh, uh, very nice talk. Uh, I appreciate it going over so much material uh, with such big samples. Uh, one of the improvements uh, of big samples comes with the, the fact that then you, you, you also address the, the numbers, kind of the, the, the number densities. Uh, and so my first question was about the, the, the question of 
um, uh, volume corrections. Uh, you you sample uh, a range of redshifts, and uh, you know uh, M thirty two would not be visible at, at Virgo yeah. as a galaxy, pretty much. So this is one question. I, I don't know if you've if you've discussed it during the talk, uh, but I I, di I didn't detect it. So if, if you could go over the question of the of the, uh, uh, the, the the kind of the completeness corrections. Yeah, yeah. I'm sorry. The second question, the two questions together. Okay. The second question is about uh, what Rosa was saying, and uh, what your comment about having gone out to about one effective radius. Um, when when doing modeling, typically the the two stage uh, models for elliptical formation uh, talk about the inner half inner effective radius being older, being, you know, possibly dissipationally formed, whereas the outer part being more accreted. Um, so I, I was wondering if your data does cover uh, radially enough of this outer part to be able to say something about these models. So um, it, uh, for, some of the, for most of the galaxies, it reaches 1.5 RE. But uh, the signal to noise drops steadily with the, with the distance to the center. And therefore, you can do that kind of analysis, but of course, uh, uh, not measuring the IMF. One good thing, um, one result that I like about our work, I didn't present it here, but if you look at the um, uh, stellar population profiles by fixing the IMF to group uh, or allowing IMF variations, in general, the trends remain the same. So the IMF mostly affects the mass to light gradient, but it doesn't really affect the differences uh, between the, the ages of the different stellar uh, of the different beams, nor the shape of the gradient. So maybe we could uh, think about extending the analysis to outer radius by uh, reducing the signal to noise if we don't uh, care about the IMF so much. And that's something that, that could be done. And I think it's really, really interesting. Um, I'm also very interested in uh, observing this, some of these samples to outer right, uh, ready. And uh, last year I posted, I, I made a GT, GTC proposal, which was, uh, which, which was rejected, but I will try to, to improve my, my proposal content because I think it will be nice to observe at least a few of, of these objects to the outer regions. But again, these objects, are, they're very faint in the outskirts, so you need a lot of observation time and, and you know that there's um, a lot of competition for that. And regarding the, the volume corrections, you're totally right. I forgot to mention, uh, of course, we apply the volume corrections. Each galaxy in Manga has a, a, a correction uh, due to the, to the volume limited sample. And all these fractions that I saw are volume limited corrected. Thanks for uh, uh, thinking about this. Thank you, Mark. And we have another question, Amidou. Please go on. Um, yeah, thank you very much. Thanks a lot for this uh, brilliant talk. It's um, very interesting. I have a quick question, but I'm afraid it's going to be a bit uh, off topic. But uh, you briefly mentioned the, um, or oh, you showed the angular momentum, variation of the angular momentum for the early type galaxies. Mm -hmm. I believe for fast and slow rotators, I can't, uh, yeah. I'm not quite sure. I was um, curious to see whether uh, you would show us the same plot for the lenticulars. When we know that uh, in the, uh, you know, the, uh, on, on average, the angular momentum of early type galaxies is kind of a slower, um, lower than that of um, spiral galaxies, late type galaxies. So I was wondering to see whether, uh, you know, uh, what, uh, how this compares basically to um, uh, lenticular galaxies. Yes, uh, so that's a very nice question. I didn't show because actually all of the lenticulars are fast rotators. So they all fall, um, I think it's three or four galaxies that are just in the age of the slow rotator. But that's why I didn't separate the lenticular sample into fast and slow rotators because all of them can be considered fast rotators. So, Thank you for the questions. Any other question for, for Elena? If none, thank you Elena again for this talk and 
As Isabel told you in the beginning of the talk, you are welcome to come to Granada and give us another talk or just to visit us here. Okay, I hope so, it can be very soon. Thanks a lot for, for the opportunity of presenting my work. Thank you very much again. Have a nice day.